There is a lot of concern in accounting about cash and cash equivalents. And that's because these two assets are the most liquid of all the company's assets and have a great bearing on the company's perceived short-term solvency. Now I probably lost you with a few of those terms, so I think we need to consider some definitions. Liquidity refers to the company's ability to raise cash. And a liquid asset is one that can be turned into cash in a relatively short period of time and with reasonable certainty. The more liquid a company is, the better able it is to meet its obligations when they come due and to bail itself out of trouble if unexpected emergencies arise. A company that's not very liquid may not be able to meet its current obligations, may not be able to survive an emergency, and when a company can't pay its bills, then we refer to the company as being insolvent, and this usually leads to bankruptcy. Cash represents cash on hand and cash in the till, and also cash in the bank, checking account balances and savings accounts. Cash equivalents are investments that are pretty close to being cash. They're highly liquid and they have a short-term maturity. A cash equivalent must have, according to the accounting rules, a maturity date of no more than 90 days and we have to be reasonably sure we'll be able to collect it when it does mature. So something like a short-term 30 or 60 day treasury bill, a bank certificate of deposit as long as its term isn't more than 90 days, and that sort of investment could be classified as a cash equivalent. But an investment in Florida swampland, when we don't know when it could be sold and how much we would receive, could not be called a cash equivalent. Since cash is highly liquid and is used many times a day in hundreds and thousands of transactions, then we have some grave internal control considerations and concerns about cash management. A good internal control over cash payments is to follow a policy of always paying by check. If we do this, then each month the bank will send us the bank statement and we will be able to look at the return checks and verify our records regarding who the payee of the check was, that is the person who received the money, who signed the check, was this a person who is authorized to write the check, and the amount, is the amount correct according to our books and our records regarding the cash payments. When the bank statement is received, the company will go through a formal process of completing what's called a bank reconciliation. Companies, especially large companies, may have accounts with several banks, maybe hundreds of banks all around the world. So doing bank reconciliations can be a very time-consuming and involved job. The process of doing a bank reconciliation is really pretty easy. You can see that we have a balance given to us on the bank statement. This is what the bank says we have in the account at the end of the month. We're going to need to look at our records and determine whether there are things that we know about that the bank had not recorded as of the statement date. These things will need to be adjustments that will have to be made to the bank balance in order to correct it and make it agree with our balance. There will be things that will add and some things that will subtract from the bank balance as reported by the bank to arrive in an adjusted, you can think of this as a corrected balance. Now also, our balance may need to be adjusted so if we find out things that were included in the bank statement that we did not know about, then we'll have to adjust our balance and add some things, subtract some others, and eventually arrive at an adjusted balance. When we're all finished, the two adjusted balances should be in agreement. We should have reconciled the differences between them and brought them into agreement. That's why the bank reconciliation is called what it is. Here we have a detailed example of a bank reconciliation and we can use it to illustrate the process of preparing the reconciliation 
and looking at the things that account for differences between the bank balance and the company's own book balance. In this example, the balance according to the bank statement is $5,000, but the balance according to the company's own books is only $2,215. That's quite a difference, and we're going to want to account for it by preparing the bank reconciliation. Let's begin with the bank balance. One of the things we'll need to add to the bank balance will be any deposits that we know we have made but that have not been recorded by the bank as of the bank statement date. These are called deposits in transit. And since we know we made them and the bank simply hadn't recorded them at the time the statement was prepared, then we'll need to correct the bank balance and add to it the amount of these deposits. Another thing that's similar to deposits in transit are outstanding checks. These are checks that we know we wrote, but they haven't cleared against the bank account as of the statement date. So we have a, someone who's received one of our checks who hasn't deposited it yet, or if it has been deposited, it just hasn't made its way through the clearing system to be presented for payment at our bank. Well, we know we wrote the checks, and we've reduced our account accordingly, the bank hasn't received the checks yet, so we'll need to correct the bank balance by subtracting these outstanding checks. Another thing that could account for differences would be mistakes that the bank may have made. And then depending on the mistake that we discover, we'll need to either add something or subtract something to correct the error on the bank statement balance. Let's take a look at the company's balance now. One thing that may need to be added to it would be a note collection by the bank. If we've had a customer pay a note at the bank for us instead of paying us directly, then the bank would have recorded the receipt, but we would not have yet recorded the collection on our books. When we get the bank statement and see that the customer did pay the note, then we'll, of course, be ready to record it, but it hasn't been recorded yet. So we'll need to add to our balance the face value of this note, in this case $3,000. But in addition to the face value of the note, the bank would have also collected interest on the note. So we'll need to add to our balance the amount of the interest collection, and if we've earned interest just on the account balance itself, and most banks will pay interest on account balances, then that's another thing that we'll find out about when we receive the statement and need to add to our balance to correct it. There are things that need to be subtracted as well. For instance, among our canceled checks may be a customer's check that we previously deposited. Now it's come back to us with our canceled checks and it has red letters stamped on it, NSF, which stands for non-sufficient funds. So this is a check that bounced. It was presented for payment against the customer's bank, and the bank said, I'm sorry, the customer doesn't have sufficient funds in the account to cover the check. When it came back, our bank reduced our account balance, but we haven't done that. We'll now need to correct our balance by subtracting out the amount of this NSF check. Now, in addition to the NSF check, we may find out that there were charges that the bank imposed on our account, uh, for, for instance, for check printing or other kinds of services. Uh, often, if the note was collected by the bank, the bank will charge a fee for this collection as well. So any bank charges or fees that we discover need to be adjustments to our reported book balance, and we'll have to subtract these fees and service charges from it. Then, of course, it's always possible that we've made errors, and then depending on the error itself, we'll need to add or subtract from our balance to correct for our error. And after doing all this, then hopefully we've brought the balances into agreement. And in this case we did. We have $5,250 for the adjusted bank balance and the same amount for our adjusted book balance after preparing the bank reconciliation. Uh, note in this example that we did discover errors. The bank had made errors and we had as well. And if we had not done the bank reconciliation, 
then these errors may not have ever been discovered. So by doing the bank reconciliation, we are providing for good internal control over our cash balance. Now, any adjustment that we have made to our book balance represents something that happened that affected cash that we have not yet recorded. So any adjustment to our book balance is going to require a journal entry. We're now looking at the section of the bank reconciliation that deals with adjustments to the company's cash balance. As we said, these things all represent events that did affect the company's cash, but these receipts and payments have not been recorded, so we'll have to make journal entries to record the payments and the receipts. Let's begin with the receipts. We had a collection of a note done by the bank for us. So we'll need to credit notes receivable for the face value of the note and then record interest revenue earned on the note. Overall then we need to debit cash for $3,100. We also had interest that was earned on the company's checking account and that $50 debit to cash will correspond to $50 of interest that's been earned so we'll need a credit to interest revenue. And then we had to correct an error and it'll be necessary to dig through our records to discover what error was made. In this case we've determined that we made a mistake in recording the payment for supplies. So since we recorded $20 too much in cash paid out for the supplies we'll need to debit cash to correct for that error and that means that we would have also recorded twenty dollars more in supplies than we actually bought. So we'll have to credit supplies for the twenty dollar error. We've now recorded the receipts. Let's take a look at the payments. One thing we need to do is reduce cash by the amount of the NSF check. After all, this check was not good so we didn't really make a deposit in our bank account when we took it to the bank. Therefore, let's credit cash for the $95, and now we'll try to collect cash or receive another check from our customer, so until we do, we have an account receivable with the customer. So it's debit accounts receivable and credit cash. Then the bank service charge and the bank fees need to be accounted for. Most companies won't set up a separate account for smaller expenditures like this, and instead they would just put the amounts into a general account called miscellaneous expense. So that's what we've done here. And both the $10 and the $15 bank charges and fees are being recorded as a $25 debit to miscellaneous expense with a $25 credit to cash. And then finally there was another error that we needed to correct. And in this case we'll credit cash for the $25 and then it'll be necessary to discover what transaction was recorded incorrectly so that we can correct the remaining portion of the transaction. And in this case, we've determined that our cash deposit from the day's sales was over-recorded by $25. So that means we debited cash and credited sales for $25 too much when we recorded the deposit. So to correct, we'll need to debit sales for $25 and credit cash for 25.